And we're going to go right back to Representative uh, Baginski. Representative Baginski, you are currently, we just, we're going to close up on 5710. Um, Great. Unless, are there any questions on 5710, uh, which we just heard from Representative Baginski? Uh, we're, all, all your bills are a little bit related, is that correct? Yes, I have another one that's very closely related to opioid abuse. That's 5709. Okay, if you don't go, mind, I'll do that one next. Go right ahead with that. Thank you. Thank you so much. 5709 is really important to me. It would ensure that health insurance companies extend their coverage for substance abuse treatment to include 90 days in a mental health facility. I think anyone with some common sense will tell you that seven or 14 days inpatient is not enough to help someone who's really suffering and struggling with addiction and dependence. So this bill would expand coverage for mental health and substance abuse up to 90 days, plain and simple. Okay, are there any questions for the representative from the committee? Okay, and we have uh, one caller, two callers. Oh, I'm sorry, <laughs> Representative Morgan, go right ahead. Yes, thank you, Chairman. I just have a, I guess, a, an observation. I notice, I mean, uh, honestly, uh, extending care to somebody who is drug addicted is a worthy, is a worthy goal, right? Drug addiction destroys lives. Mm -hmm. But I've noticed that there are three bills that we're hearing tonight, not all from you, Representative Bikinski, but from others, that add other mandates onto our insurance policies. Um, I, I haven't checked lately, but the last time I checked, which was about three years ago, Rhode Island has the most mandates on our health insurance policies. We have 72 I think was, no, maybe it was 74. The average for the country is 46, and the lowest is around 19. Every mandate adds costs to our insurance policies, and that means it adds costs to every family who pays a premium, and we all pay pre premiums. So every time we add a mandate, we actually increase the costs to everyone else. Now, everybody will say, well, this will only, I don't really know how much this would cost. I don't know if Ms. Uh, Representative Baginski has gotten a cost um, analysis of this. But for instance, we offer IVF, which is almost not, not offered at all across the country. That adds 3% to everyone's cost of health insurance. Others at a quarter of a percent, a half of a percent, one percent. You can see after you get 74, you've added a lot of cost. And, and, and this is a real, in, a, a real problem, I think, when we understand that just average families out there are spending, you know, eight, ten, $12,000 a year for their premiums and their health care coverage. So this is, this is a, I mean, this is a valid thing, helping people with drug addictions. But at some point we have to say, how many more mandates are we going to put on our insurance policies? Because every time we add a mandate, we hurt everyone else in the state by increasing their cost of insurance. And that's all. That's it. Thank you. May I reply, Chairman? Yes, go right ahead. Thank you so much. Representative Morgan, I appreciate your point. I really do about premiums going up. But I would ask you to consider a few things. Given the pandemic, 378 Rhode Islanders died of overdose last year. So this problem is reaching a breaking point in the state. And second, Rhode Island Blue Cross, I think, has had a pretty nice profit last year. I'm not gonna, you know, posit an amount without having it in front of me. But I would ask maybe that the health insurers come to the table and decide how to reappropriate some of their funds to put the focus on preventative care and preventative maintenance and mental health benefits so that we can start to treat patients before they get to a critical point and end up hospitalized 
and costing the insurers more money. So that's the impetus of this bill, to put more focus on preventative care and behavioral mental health services. Thank you, Representative. Are there any other questions uh, regarding House Bill 5709? Representative Speakman, go right ahead. Thank you, Chairman. Thank you, Representative Baginski, for doing this. This is crucial. I have some concerns about supply of beds, though. Uh, I think uh, 90 days is probably too little time for someone with substance use disorder. Um, however, I'm, I'm not sure we have enough beds even for folks who are using the, the three or seven day programs. Um, so, and I think you'll also see these facilities complaining about low reimbursement rates as well. So I think we probably need to work bro more broadly in addition to your bill on supply of beds and reimbursement rates, especially for Medicaid patients. But thank you for doing this. It's a, it's a great start. Oh, thank you. And I appreciate that feedback. I'll certainly take that into consideration. And I'm working very clo closely with an old colleague, uh, Senator Tassoni. So he and I will certainly be happy to dive into those details and see who else we can bring to the table and maybe change the language if necessary. Thank you very much. And he certainly knows uh, this area very well. So thank you. Mm -hmm. Thank you. Are there any other questions from the committee? If not, we're going to move on to testimony. John Tassoni. Yeah. yeah. John, this is Representative yeah. Casey. How are you, sir? Good, Mr. Chairman and members of the committee. Thank you for indulging me uh, on this piece of legislation. As uh, Representative Baginski said, uh, we broke a record last year on overdoses of over 400 here in Rhode Island. Uh, the amount of time that the insurance companies are giving someone who's in detox is only 14 days. When I first got involved in this situation, uh, there were upwards of 30, 60, 90, 120 days people were able to stay into treatment and residential care. Now they're at 14. And when they get to 14, then they get on the phone and they call, whether it be United, or any of the other providers, and you're not you're not talking to somebody here in Rhode Island. You're talking to somebody overseas that's making a determination on the health of our residents in Rhode Island. Now, if you were to look at the statistics right now, one individual with 14 days of treatment is going back to that facility at least three, four, five, six times for treatment. So if you give them the original treatment in the beginning, most of the stuff would be addressed and people would get on the road to recovery at a quicker rate. Now, to get to uh, Representative Morgan's point, I, I get the mandates, but you also have to look at the point of, if you watch the players' uh, golf tournament this weekend, who was the biggest sponsor? Optum. Who is the biggest sponsor for the uh, professional soccer teams that we have in Gillette Stadium, United Health. Why are they spending so much money on advertisement when that money could be spent for treatment? When I started in this business, it was one in five families were affected. Now we're one in two families. And we only see this progressively getting worse due to the pandemic and due to fentanyl coming on the street faster than we know what to do with. So with that being said, I will, I will help. I will try to get a reasonable amount of time for 14 days in residential treatment for these people that are addicted to fentanyl. It's not happening. And we're going to probably break another record next year if we don't get these people into treatment. Thank you for your testimony, John. Are there any questions for John Tassoni? Uh, okay, we have uh, Representative Morgan. Hi. Yes, Mr. Tassoni. Um, have you done any cost analysis on, on what this would cost? No, have you done I any analysis done, at all? I have not done any analysis, but I will tell you, if you send someone back five, six, seven times, it costs more to do that than it would the 90 days. Do you know how many, what the data is on how many people are successful after one trip or two trips? 
do they all go back four, five, six times? Do you have any data on the success rates? Uh, we can get you that data. I'll be more than happy to do that. But let me tell you something. Um, when people get into recovery, relapse is always a part of recovery. And it happens 14 days is not enough. If you wanted to put a bill in that says uh, you cannot advertise and utilize all that money, the millions and millions of dollars, then I would support that one also. Okay, I just would like to see the data on how effective the programs are. But then this, the, the last question is, I know that there are drugs now that um, they have been developing for, for quite a few years that if somebody has uh, gone through one of the short programs, um, they, they take this drug and it inhibits the, the need to search out the drug. Um, and they pair that with then talk therapy or, you know, like a, 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 an AA buddy so that they always have somebody to rely on. But they take this drug monthly. I think they're, they're finding that if they do it uh, subdurally, they can put in enough of, the, of this uh, drug that it inhibits the, the, the searching for the opioid. Um, do you have any data on how those programs are going? I know that they've, they've used them at our prison, at the ACI, with a lot of success. Yeah, that's medicated do, assistant treatment. That's used all, all over the state of Rhode Island. Uh, well, so but, do, but, do you have any data yeah. on how effective those, those treatment plans are? Yeah, well, I can uh, absolutely get you that data. That's, that's not hard to get. Okay, great. Thank you. Thank you, representatives. Are there any other questions from the committee on this bill? Okay, if not, we're going to move on to the next one for Representative Baginski. Go ahead, Jackie. Thank you so much, Chairman. This one's kind of interesting. It was drafted with the advice and assistance of the Rhode Island Medical Society. The federal government recently passed um, a resolution that has a great intention, but some unintended consequence. So if you take a blood test or have any sort of biopsy done, the federal government would like us to streamline the delivery of those records and test results to patient portals electronically. But what's happening is patients are getting information in their patient portals that their doctor has not had a chance to review with them yet. So imagine you have a, a little skin tumor biopsy, you might get an email from your patient portal that tells you you have a malignant tumor without the opportunity to have a conversation with your physician. So you now call your doctor in a panic and say, oh my gosh, what does this mean? What do I do? So this bill would change the distribution of electronic medical records to patient portals. It would require at least 24 hours for physicians to review make sure there are no critical lab values that patients wouldn't want to receive on their own. Thank you, Representative Baginski. Are there any questions regarding House Bill 5711 from the committee? Okay, Representative Baginski, stay with us. Um, we're going back uh, for 5709. We have one more witness, um, Ms. Tara sure. Lavasso. She's on the line regarding the mental illness substance abuse insurance. Hello, Tara. Hello. Hi, Tara. This is Representative Casey. I'm Chairman of the Health and Human Services Committee. You're here to testify on House Bill 5709. If you would go ahead. Hi. I am here in support of um, House Bill 5709 for the insurance companies to support uh, mental illness and substance abuse. Um, limited costs for mental illness tears families apart. Um, both financially and emotionally. Mental health and substance abuse, um, especially mental health, is a problem and it won't seem, and it is not going to go away. Insurance companies pay for more for the sick of heart than the sick of mind. Um, we have to face this problem. Um, we cannot continue to use our prisons or as a modern day version of psychiatric hospitals. We cannot continue to have the state cut its funding to the community mental health boards or shove our mentally ill onto the welfare or Medicaid rolls. 
we have to, we cannot burden our taxpayers with the inefficient and expensive system of delivering services to our mentally ill or shove them into back alleys or homeless shelters. We need to support our mentally ill with medical insurance and benefits. The suicide rate for undiagnosed and untreated depression is the second most common cause of death, especially in youth ages 15 to 19, who end up in our emergency um, hospital rooms instead of getting treatment. That care, uh, the cost of that medical treatment is outrageous and staggering, and in fact, we could lower, better mental health coverage will lower those health care costs. Um, so I'm in support of insurance companies taking more of a role in supporting mental health issues and getting our youth and our adults the more care that they need. That is all I have to say on the issue. Thank you, Tara. Are there any questions for Tara, please? Okay, hearing none, that'll reclose the uh, House uh, hearing on 5709. Representative Beginsky, before we close 5711, do you have any final statement or, or uh, any, are there any questions from the committee at this time? Okay, one more from, uh, from uh, Representative Speakman. Go right ahead, please. This is on the um, medical records. 5711, uh, five, uh -huh. yep. Yeah, I, I'm having a hard time with the language. So okay. it says no consent shall be required to release the information to an ordering physician, the results of any life-threatening clinical laboratory test for any patient 24 hours before informing the patient. So does this mean that the labs must inform the physician before they inform the patient? Yes. Is that what it- Exactly. Is that what it says? I know that's what you want it to mean, but is that what the language says? It looks, it, do, it looks to me, it, um, it, I'm not a lawyer. To me though. it does, but I, we, I'm happy to clean it up. I hear it, it is a little confusing. I'm happy to clean it up. Because it just says you don't have to consent. The patient's consent is not required to release the information to the ordering physician. But it doesn't say the, it, it doesn't say the lab must let the physician know before the patient. And I thought that's what you said you were trying to well, get Well, I think if you go back and read the sections of the bill, it's a little bit more clear. I think this is a poor summary. So I'm happy to revise it and work on it. And I'm happy to take any suggestions you might have. I can have a chat with Steve Detoy and take it back to ledge council. So I'm happy to to consider doing that. Yeah, I was reading from the language of the bill, not from the summary. But okay, just take a note. Maybe I'm, I may be just tired, and it might be late. So no, I think I think you're correct, Representative Speakman. It's a little it's a little bit unclear. Yeah. Um, not not necessarily the uh, the summary, but right. when you get to the language on line uh, lines nine through thirteen, yeah. I think it's a little unclear as to exactly what the procedure is. So we may want to take a look at that. Um, and kind of clean that up uh, t to make it a little bit more clear. Thank you, I appreciate that. Thank, Thank you. Thank you. Thank you for the feedback. Okay. I really appreciate that. Are there any I'm other questions? Are there any other questions for Representative Beginsky? Representative, thank you so much for being brief and concise. We appreciate that, and uh, we'd love to have you back anytime. Oh, don't tempt me. Okay, that's going to thanks, guys. That's going to close Bye -bye. the hearing for House Bill Five Seven One One. Uh, we're going to move on to two bills by Representative Phillips, uh, 5705 and then 5706. Representative Phillips is here uh, with us in studio. Go ahead, Representative Phillips. Live and in technicolor. There you go. Thank you. <laughs> we'll start with House Bill H5705. This bill actually came to us in 2019, late 2019, early 2020 actually from the state of Ohio. It's a compact that is incentivizing companies to come up with cures for diseases, not just medicating and, and getting people to uh, be able to live with the disease they have. 
Um, it's a unique bill. It's very intense. I've tried to read it a couple of times, and to be honest with you, I don't, re I don't understand every single um, line of this bill myself, but I do know that a, f a couple of states, Ohio passed it in July of 2019, and it came to us from the Speaker Pro Tempore from Ohio, which is Representative Butler at the time, and he came out, he called and emailed me and the speaker and said that he's coming out to New England to try and see if he can drum up some support for the compact here. And one section on page seven, which I thought is something that should be noted, is that in order to award the prizes to the companies that come up with the cures, the price amount with respect to the cures for each disease shall, shall be equal to the most recent estimated total five-year savings in public health expenses. So we're going to have public health expenses, so they're going to award prizes or monetary awards to these companies that are coming up. Imagine us curing cancer or imagine us cur curing diabetes instead of just live, having people live with it and having the... Um, insulin and everything else there. Similar to what we did with polio many years ago. This is what this bill is supposed to do. It's supposed to get states on board so that we can try to find cures for these diseases. And that is the gist of this bill, H5705. Thank you, Representative Phillips. Are there any questions from the committee? Me. Representative Donovan, please. Vice Chair Donovan, go ahead. <laughs> Thank you, Representative. Um, so the money is donated, Representative Phillips. It, it will be it will be accru accrued from the um, recent five years of whatever amount of savings will be on the health expenses. If we're spending, let's say, aggregately in this state, we're spending millions of dollars, like say five million dollars on diabetes, and we cure diabetes altogether. So we each year we do it. So we'll be putting into that pot of money. $25 million. Other states that are in this compact will be putting in similar amounts and then it would be awarded to that, but we end up winning because we're curing the disease and people are going to be less, we're going to have less expenses in the healthy. Okay, so the money we, but where does the money come from? Like it's just the money saved and it, then? From what I can remember from what uh, Representative Butler had brought to us, it would be Part of it's going to be brought in by the insurance companies that would oh. be paying the insurance um, premium, not the premiums, but the expenses in that. So, okay. so if, we, if they would actually pay $5 million, let's say that use that same figure, $5 million in one year for diabetes, instead of expending it to, um, to the doctors and to, to the um, pharmacies, they would put it back and put it into this pot that would go to pay the companies that are coming up with complete cures. Thank you. Thank you, Representative Donovan, for the question. Are there any other questions for Representative Phillips? Uh, Representative Kassar, go ahead. Thank you, Rep. Phillips. Um, this is an interesting bill, and like you said, it's a little wonky. Um, <laughs> <laughs> but um, the, there's a provision in it where the patent would revert to the commission can you talk a little With bit? With a what, please? Um, so the patent for the cures yeah. would... Um, oh, the patent, yes. 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 Well, transfer to the commission. Can you talk about that? Because that feels like from I, a... I honestly a do not have that view. answer. I don't okay. want to give you an answer that is incorrect. So, I mean, I can reach out to Representative Butler again and see if he can come up with um, some of the reasoning in there. So... Uh, have there been, in the other states, are there particular cures that have been... Uh, sort of through this prize process? They're, they're in the process of trying to get, they need to get a minimum of six or seven states into the compact okay. before they bring this forward any further. But I know that Ohio passed it and they said that there was three or four other states that were looking at okay. it back in 2019. Okay. Whether they've passed them or not, I, I'm not 100% sure. I haven't talked to Representative Butler in probably a year since COVID hit. Okay. He actually came in and sat in our, in our meeting. He was impressed with our state house and the way that we run our okay. meetings. Okay. So he was very pleased to come out here. He says he hopes to come out again, but I don't know when. Great. 
Okay, so we'd be an early adopter. We would be one of the original okay. adoptions. Okay, great, thank you. Thank you. Are there any other questions from the committee? Okay, hearing none, we will close the hearing on House Bill 5705. We're gonna move on to House Bill 5706 by Representative Phillips. Um, this is regarding uh, health and safety and Representative Phillips, go ahead, you have the floor. Thank you, Chairman, members of the committee. This one right here is mainly for transparency. Uh, we have already in state law that we have exemptions from vaccinations by either a medical condition or medical issue or a religious exemption. Those are the two exemptions that are allowed in law. Unfortunately, a lot of school department and mainly the, it's coming to me from parents with, of school age children, but there are forms that have, they have to fill out that are not having that they have the right for an exemption either by a religious or a medical reason. And there's also some other state forms that have the same thing that they don't let. So they're not being transparent. They're not letting the general public know that they have these options. It is already in law and we need to just let them be able to take advantage because they think they don't have that option. So they already think that they have to vaccinate their children. So this is the reason why this is coming out. I've had a numerous amount of people send me emails, um, give me phone calls at my office. And I just said, you know, we, we got to be transparent. We, if we're going to be wanting them to be trusting us, we need to trust them and let them make the right decisions for their children. So hence this bill here. And I know we have quite a few people that want to talk on this bill. Thank you, Representative Phillips. Are there any questions from the committee at this time? If not, we're gonna move. Okay, uh, Representative Potter, go ahead. Thank you, Mr. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. Um, Rep. Phillips, I don't, I don't wanna to get too down in the rabbit hole on this, um, and I don't have a direct question per se, but I do wanna share that when I first read it, I did have a little bit of a concern. Okay. Um, and, I, and I get that we wanna be transparent and certainly we wanna have people know what their, what their legal rights are, but in light of a global pandemic where we're all still here wearing masks, where wearing a mask itself has been such a struggle, and there is so much science denial, uh, and people have a lot of fear about vaccines, and we hear a lot of disinformation that gets circulated around, and it makes people more paranoid. I really wonder if there's um, some hesitation that we should have and some concern that we should have about the suggestive nature of making sure that this is disclosed to people. Whereas, um, you know, is this gonna make them feel as if there's something that they should be concerned about where they're otherwise not? So I know that's not a question, but I did wanna just voice my initial concern on it. I don't know if you have anything that, that you'd like to share on it. I'm happy, to, I'm happy to listen. I'm not adamantly opposed to it, but it was something that I, you know, when we're looking around a room, we're, we're all wearing a mask. Yeah. I, I do think it's relevant to kind of bring that element up. Well, this is this bill actually came up before the pandemic actually came out. So, but it, it would hold true to it if people are have that right to have the exemption either for a medical purpose or a religious purpose. We do not have, and we've had bills in in the past about a philosophical exemption, but that's never passed. But because we, do, they do have the parents do have the right to uh, opt out on vaccinations under religious or medical reasons, why would it be any different? Why do we not want to be transparent? Why do we not want to let them know that, yes, you have this option. We're just trying to, you know, maybe do a bait and switch and say, yeah, you have it, but we're not gonna let you know you have it. So this is just telling our state government and our local communities, because the, it's in law, you need to do this. That's it, pure and simple. It's transparency. Representative Phillips, can yeah. just clar clarify for the committee, if you would, this is only requiring the school department to notify people that they have the possibility of an exemption for those particular reasons. Correct. It is, they, a lot of students have, or parents have to sign forms when they enroll their uh, kids in school and they have to check off that they've done this, this, and this, but they don't have on the forms that they have these exemptions available to them. Okay. So it's just letting them know that it's available. 
Thank not you. telling them they have to do it. Okay. Thank you for the clarification. Um, Representative Bennett has a question. Hey, um, Representative Phillips, besides Jehovah Witness, what other religion would stop you from getting a vaccination? There could be a numerous, if, for, if, if a uh, certain sect of either um, the Catholicism religion, maybe Muslims may uh, have an adverse um, reason for not vaccinating. I don't know specific ones, but any religion could give you, uh, if you have a priest or a pastor, uh, an imam that says, I don't, our religion or our sect of the religion does not allow vaccinations, then it gives them that option. Thank you very much. Thank you, Representative Phillips. I have Representative Fogarty with a question, please. I don't really have a question per se. I just want to go back and do a little revision, not revision, it's history, history of what's happened in, in before the, before the vaccine, before we were in this pandemic. Years ago, and um, we, had a, we had a doctor in England, his name was Dr. Wakefield, I'm from Wakefield, so I remember. And he had a small cross section of patients who um, had, who developed, um, um, oh God, I'm, forgetting, I'm forgetting the name of the, um, they were on the spectrum. So, thank you. Autism. Yes, autism, thank you. I'm sorry, I can't believe I forgot that. Um, and so, uh, you know, he put out a study saying um, when the autism gene is expressed around the 11, 12 month period of time, um, that he correlated that with the MMR vaccine. And then um, with this small subset of patients, you know, he went out and he published this and people picked up on it. And what ended up happening, as we saw in the U.S., is that people stopped taking the MMR vaccine um, and then we started seeing measles, things we never saw before, mumps. People were getting mumps. Adults are getting mumps again, um, rubella. But mostly it was measles and mumps that we were seeing. So uh, then they were also saying that there was a, you know, inside the um, vaccine that there was thimerosal, which caused the autism. And, you know, because it was an ingredient that preserved the vaccines. Well, after all this and people putting signs everywhere, I saw them on the farms and in, in, in out in, uh, as you drove along the farm in Middletown um, um, and all over the country, people weren't taking these. And again, increased all these things that we had not seen before. Um, and then they found out, you know, that dimerosol had nothing to do with it. So I get very, very uptight about bills like this. I have to be very, very uh, conscious. I sold vaccines. Uh, I, I sold them for GlaxoSmithKline for years. I didn't sell any measles and mumps for Bella. Um, but I know that, you know, people stopped taking vaccines and, and people look for any type of excuse. I saw letters coming in from people saying, well, they, my grandchild might have some DNA type thing that might have a reaction with, with this vaccine. I'm like, so this is going to be how people are going to sign off that they medically can get away from taking these vaccines because there might be some type of a DNA type test. That's where we start seeing all of these diseases starting to come back and affecting people. That really is not right. So, uh, you know, if people have to jump through hoops to get their kids vaccinated, if they want to sign off and say that they have a religious thing and something happens to their kids, the same thing happened with the, with the, vi the vaccine that came out for protecting uh, kids from HPV. And then all this stuff started to write. This is something I couldn't wait to get my daughter vaccinated right away. If you can prevent them from getting um, cancer, cervical cancer, and then when my son was able to get vaccinated, I got him vaccinated. Some people, yes, might have a reaction to them. Yes, anytime you put something in your body, you might have a, a type of an autoimmune response. But vaccines are why we're here today. This is one of the, the, one of the most, sci the scientific breakthrough um, besides, you know, um, penicillin, but vaccines are, have been around for hundreds of years and have been protecting us. And all of this stuff on the internet and these people, I'm going to tell you, I would vote against this bill completely. They can have all the different things, but these school departments, these kids have to be vaccinated before they go into school departments. They can send me as many letters as they want. I'm adamant about this. I it just, there's not enough religious um, and, and scientific thing to say not to get vaccinated. Um, so that's my two cents for it. I just get very, very upset about this particular thing. I saw a kid who had pertussis, whooping cough in the hospital when I was a drug rep. And to see this kid in this oxygen tent crib coughing uncontrollably 
it would make anybody change their mind about vaccinating their children. I'm not taking it out on you, Dr. Uh, Representative Phillips. I just am very passionate about making sure that people don't use these excuses not to get vaccinated. But this, but this bill is not advocating for that for them not to take it. This is just telling them what their rights are. So I don't know. Uh, I'm going to go after not after you personally, but after your statement. So you'd rather have the people in the dark and not know that they have uh, options available they, to they're them. They're well aware of all the options that are out there, and they're going to try. But if they're not being notified, not they're, they're notified. I, I believe they're notified. Believe me, they know. Thank you, Representative Fogarty. Uh, Representative Speakman, you have a question? Go right ahead, please. Um, when a, I haven't registered kids for school for a very long time, so I don't know what kind of paperwork you get, but I know that there are lots of requirements that all kids have, but that some kids, for a variety of reasons, opt out of. For example, pledging allegiance to the flag. Jehovah's Witnesses are prohibited from doing that by their religion. Some kids have to opt out of recess for whatever reasons. Other kids have to opt in to occupational therapy or special reading programs. So I just, I wonder when you go to school, are you given a list of all the things you have a right to do or not to do as a student, or is it up to the parents to sort of figure out what their kids need and don't need and to advocate for them? So in this, I'm not sure why this particular right is, um, would be privileged among all the other things that parents have to uh, work on when they register their kids for school. Thank you. Thank you. Uh, we have a question from Representative McLaughlin. Go right ahead, sir. Your microphone, sir. Come on. There we go. Uh, yes, uh, Rep. Rep. Phillips. In in reference to uh, the bill that you have, uh, I'm looking. Uh, I, I believe. Uh, don't quote me. I could be wrong. Uh, Riot used to have, uh, you know, a bunch of do's and don'ts, you know, in reference. And they would have a box that you would check off, okay, uh, if you uh, had disagreement. I don't think they continued that, uh, or is that still? Some school departments do have the two boxes on their forms, but a lot of them don't. So, you know, we so have, there's no standardized, there's no standardized uh, okay. form that they use. You know, I do know that I was um, sent a couple of school departments forms that had the boxes on there, and then I was sent some other ones that nothing was on there at all. So, you know, telling certain communities you have that right and telling other <laughs> communities you don't, now you are picking and choosing who we get to, who gets to uh, have that option and who doesn't. That's some, that would be something to look into, you know, in reference to uh, the, uh, having a standard, you know, set forth, uh, you know, on that. And also, while I'm at it, believe it or not, uh, you know, uh, uh, certain rights, uh, you know, I believe in vaccination, okay, but I also believe you know, parents have a right. And when I say that, nations have a right. I remember when I was in Vietnam, we'd go out and, believe it or not, provide cover for uh, basically the medics who would go out into the countryside to try and inoculate people, okay? And, or issue, uh, you know, uh, they would take blood tests and they do inoculations. Well, the Buddhist religion forbid that. I actually saw, you know, people actually crying because we we're trying to help them. So it's kind of, kind of weird, you know. Thank you. Thank you, Representative. Are there any other questions for Representative Phillips? Uh, Representative Kassar, go ahead. Um, thank you, Rep. Phillips. Um, this is a bit more of a comment than a question, but um, as a person who survived childhood case of German measles, um, I am very pro-vaccination, as is my whole family that was traumatized by this that particular experience. Um, and I think we, as um, as legislators, we are responsible for helping to support our public health agencies. And I, I get the sense that this action would 
adding this to the forms would be undermining our public health efforts, as well as for our school administrations who are responsible for keeping our children safe. This would be something that would sort of curb their ability. While I understand that there's an individual right, I, it seems that our work is to protect the population as a whole and support our public health policy. Um, and just, just based on a little bit of research, it looks like there are very few religions um, that sort of have that uh, vaccine um, sort of restriction. Um, and up, in, up until now, that has not been a concern and we've been vaccinating children for decades. Um, and it feels like we, we may be undermining sort of public health in general by, by encouraging this. I don't know if you would be encouraging them or not, but you're notifying them that they have the options that are available to them. I just, you know, this is just, as I said, I put it in because I think people need to know the right, what they have for their options. I think and it's probably good if we do a little more research on who's, who's being left out of this, who, who doesn't know? Because it feels well, like it's a solution looking for a problem. Well, we have, Thank you. we have a numerous amounts, I guess that we have a few people that yeah, are going to be sure. calling in and that, so I'll let them explain their situations also. Thank you. Thank you, representatives. Uh, we are going to move to our, uh, our verbal testimony. If we could have our first witness, please. Hello, is this Ellen? Yes. Hello, Ellen. This is Representative Casey. I'm the chairman of the Health and Human Services Committee. I'm here to uh, have you testify today on House Bill 5706. This is regarding uh, the Department of the Health no Department of Health notification regarding options uh, and exemptions for vaccination. If you would go ahead with your testimony, I would appreciate it if you could keep it to two minutes, please. Okay. Thank you. Uh, good evening, and thank you, Chairman Casey and Vice Chairs McLaughlin and Donovan and members of the committee. My name is Ellen Schaefer. I'm a Rhode Island parent and a community advocate for Health Choice Rhode Island. I'm testifying in support of H5706 and uh, respectfully request your support. Um, it's already been established this evening that it's a fact that the Rhode Island Department of Health um, removed the religious exemption checkbox from the form. Um, sometime it appears from um, evidence on um, the internet that it was prior to March of, uh, or after March of 2015. Prior to that, the religious discrimination, or the religious um, checkbox appeared on the form. So why and when it was removed is a question that nobody can really answer. The Rhode Island Department of Health hasn't an answered it. And it really does give the appearance of some kind of religious discrimination because the medical checkbox still appears, um, while the option of the existing right on Rhode, in Rhode Island state law for so the religious exemption has disappeared from the form and is also absent from uh, communication to schools and parents from the Department of Health. Anywhere there is a mention of a requirement. Um, there is no mention of exemptions. With um, regard to Representative Fogarty's comment saying, believe me, they know that they have this right, um, I'm not sure what evidence you have to that, but I have plenty of evidence to the contrary because I'm a, in a position to field many calls from uh, Rhode Islanders all throughout the state who are very confused because they, don't, they can't find anywhere where they're able to exercise their right. They're looking for some manner to protect their children from harms that they may have already seen with other children in their household. They're looking for a way to exercise what they know is their right, but they don't know how to do it because this information is missing from all of the forms and all of the communications that give a completely one-sided view with the terms requirement, mandatory, et cetera, et cetera. They, they do not... They feel that they have lost this right. However, they, the medical exemption seems to be there, but the religious is not. So make no mistake that this bill is not about debating the merits of vaccination. This is about whether you, as a representative, stand for transparency of existing law. And by obfuscating the law, the Department of Health is 
an absolute example of misinformation. This community that has any reason whatsoever to to um, refuse vaccination, refuse medical intervention for themselves or their children, are being blatantly misinformed. And, and this community is constantly being accused of misinformation and, uh, you know, false, you know, there's fact checkers and we're being accused of, of, of false information. This is an absolute clear example of deliberate misinformation being disseminated at a systemic level to the public. And because the public is calling it out, there's not, then the, the issue gets attacked because it's the issue that's a distraction here instead of what the real issue is, is transparency and an absolute correct representation of current law. If you don't like the current law, that is a different debate. That is a different discussion. That is not what this bill is about. And to distract and go off into debates about the merits of vaccination completely avoid the accountability to providing the correct information to the public. So if, if you oppose the bill, it is because you're deliberately trying to manipulate the information that people are privy to about their own existing rights. Thank you for the time this evening. Thank you for your testimony. Are there any questions for our witness from the committee? Okay, Ellen, thank you. Thank you very much. We appreciate your testimony. We're going to move thank on you. to the next person, please. Hello, Ms. Waldeck. Yes, hello. Hi, this is Representative Casey. I'm Chairman of the Health and Human Services Committee. You're here to testify on House Bill 5706. Um, we've just heard from Ellen Schaefer. I know you guys are associated with each other a little bit. If you could please keep your testimony brief, we would appreciate it. I will certainly try. Thank, thank you. you so much. Good evening, sir, and good evening, uh, members of the committee. Uh, thank you for your dedication to the people of Rhode Island. Thank you, Representative Phillips, for sponsoring this very important bill. My name is Christine Healy Waldeck. I am a parent and co founder of the Rhode Island Wellness Society. As a parent of school aged children, I was very disturbed to learn that there is widespread inconsistency regarding the display of immunization exemption information on our Rhode Island school physical forms. The school physical form that is provided uh, by my family's personal pediatrician's office properly displays two exemption checkboxes. However, I became de deeply concerned to see that the same school physical forms that are provided by our Rhode Island Department of Health's website only displays one exemption checkbox, and that's for the medical exemption. The Rhode Island Department of Health school physical forms omit the religious exemption checkbox altogether. Um, is this a mistake? That's what I would like to know. Um, to some people, this omission of the religious exemption checkbox may appear to be a mere clerical printing or office error. However, as a parent whose family members deeply suffered life-changing vaccine adverse reactions, I understand how crucially important it is to have immunization exemption information clearly displayed on a school physical form. I view this omission of information, whether it be accidental or intentional, as extreme negligence on the part of our Rhode Island Department of Health. Omitting any important immunization information is a violation of the informed consent ethic. Rhode Island families have the right to full disclosure of all exemption information and the right to know <laughs> that there are two legal immunization exemptions for the medical procedure of vaccination. Some families choose to opt out, to, I'm sorry, to opt their child out of a vaccination, and it is their legal and inherent human right to be able to do so. Many of these families suffered vaccine adverse events, but the individual who suffered an adverse reaction is not eligible for a medical exemption. These families have no other choice but to use a religious exemption. Some Catholic families use the religious exemption to opt their child out of vaccines that were grown from the cell lines of aborted fetuses. 
some Hindu families opt out of vaccines that contain fetal bovine serum. Many families want to opt out, opt their child out of the high-risk Gardasil 9 vaccination, which is a requirement for all of our 7th graders here in the state. Whatever the reasons may be, families have the right to know that the religious exemption is available. Families need to know this information in order to make informed medical decisions for their children. The Rhode, the Rhode Island Department of Health needs to ensure that all exemption options are clearly displayed on every school from the state. Vaccines are a liability-free, sold-for-profit pharmaceutical product. Vaccination is not a risk-free procedure. As evidenced by vaccine pharmaceutical literature, data from the Vaccine Adverse Event Reporting System, data from the HHS Health Resources and Services Administration Vaccine Injury Table, data from the Vaccine Injury Compensation Program, there are very real medical risks and very real injuries and deaths that have occurred after all vaccination procedures. If an employee at the Rhode Island Department of Health deleted the religious exemption option from the box, of, from the forms on purpose, then that employee is withholding information without the patient's knowledge or consent. And that type of behavior is ethically unacceptable and very unlawful. In closing, I implore the committee to please support 5706. Please help protect your fellow Rhode Islanders' right to transparency, consistency, informed consent, and full disclosure of all immunization exemption information. Please ensure this applies to school physical forms at our Rhode Island Department of Health and all schools in the state of Rhode Island. Thank you very much. Thank you, Christine, for your testimony. Um, we have a question from uh, Representative Fogarty. Go ahead. Uh, sure. No, I don't have a question uh, for her in particular. I just happen to be looking up myself, um, and, and I see right here on the Rhode Island Department of Health Religious in in Immunization Exemption Certificate for use in public schools, private daycare, and daycare schools and colleges. So the form is right on the... The website. Okay, so Representative Fogarty, can I answer that? Yes, go right ahead. I just sent okay, it to sorry. So, so what we're saying with this particular bill is when a family goes to get their school physical and they're up for vaccinations, and if a family wanted to opt out of a particular one, they wouldn't know. So, in order to go to the Rhode Island Department of Health website and download it, one would already have to know that. And, you know, Rep. Fogarty, I, I would just would like to let you know, I, mean, I live here in Providence. My children went to public schools here for years. And, you know, there are many families here who do not have access to the Internet still. They do not have access to computers. Many are undocumented, and they're just trying to live. And they, this is just not something on their radar, but they know that uh, they are concerned about vaccine adverse events because most families are. And I think that it's just uh, the right thing to do. It uh, protects informed consent ethic. Families have the right to know their legal rights. Are, do you, are you saying that families should be denied their legal right to know? I would put words in my mouth like that, Miss. No, Christine, yeah. let, let's let's and just. We don't have discussions, of no. course. You go through the chairperson. Yes, let, let's just dial that back a little, a little bit. I'm I so I, sorry. I understand. It's almost a rhetorical question, and I understand the nature of it. Let's just try to keep this uh, to a little bit, uh, a little bit quieted down. I I want to ask you for for my edification. Um, do you still have? children who are in school that have have received a form from their school regarding vaccinations that does not have both exemptions on it? Um, I did not. I have two children, um, and I do have one child who the, uh, the school nurse actually did let families know that there was a religious exemption as well as a medical exemption. I never received correspondence from my other child's school. Okay. But I would like to say that even in my child's pediatric office, this, that's actually where I get the school physical form usually is um, from our child's pediatrician, 
and it's clearly stated right on the form there. Um, I don't know how it is in other pediatric offices. And I apologize if I'm getting a little upset, but, you know, the, the truth is that many families don't know. And, you know, a lot of people have to rely on, um, you know, what's told to them. And it, it's only right that people have the ability to choose and to know what their legal rights are. Okay. Thank I'm you. sorry, I didn't mean to no. sound a little... Uh, no, I, I, I appreciate your passion. This is a, so, somewhat of a heated, uh, heated issue. Um, and uh, I know that there are advocates who want everybody to be vaccinated, uh, no matter what, especially children who are in school. Um, and there are those, obviously, that, that believe that they, to, they may not want their children to be vaccinated. And we're just talking here, we're only talking about being informed that there, right, are, yes. that there are options. Mm -hmm. Okay. So, and Ed, right, yes, absolutely. And I, I just would like to say I just would love it if people would pay a little bit more attention to the children who have suffered the, the adverse events and now have, you know, permanent disabilities as a result. So I always ask folks, you know, to always keep people in mind okay. who have gotten hurt. Thank you, Christine. I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to open it up to questions from the committee if you want to hold for one more minute. Are there any other questions from the committee for our witness at this time? Okay, Christine, we're going to move on. Thank you very much. Thank you so much, sir. I appreciate it. Okay. Hello, Madalena. This is Representative Casey. Hi, Chairman Casey. My name is Madalena Chirinyota, and I strongly support House Bill 5706 because it would ensure that school forms about vaccine requirements include available exemptions. And I would like to point out that my school's form that they sent home when I was enrolling my children in school did not include religious exemption. I actually just confirmed that today. So some schools are and some schools are not. My school happens to be using the one directly from the state and it does not have an exemption checkbox for religion. I wanted to thank Representative Phillips for this legislation as well as Chairman Casey for um, co-sponsoring it. Thank you for ensuring that the Department of Health as well as schools accurately represent existing law. This is a transparency bill. It doesn't actually change anything except make the law transparent. According to Statute 1638-2, Anyone entering school must show evidence that they have been vaccinated for a list of diseases or they must provide a medical or religious exemption. The state school physical form used to reflect Rhode Island law by including exemption information along with vaccine requirements. Within the past few years, however, DOH has removed exemption information from the widely used state school physical form. By omitting exemption information from school health forms, the Department of Health is clearly misinforming the public and thus incorrectly conflating compliance with the law to mean compliance with the U.S. vaccine schedule, which is incidentally the longest pediatric vaccine schedule in the entire world. Statute 1638-2 expressly affords medical and religious exemptions as part of the law. Removing exemption information is lying by omission. Lying by omission is still lying and it misinforms families to manipulate us into higher vaccine compliance. As a public school teacher and as a parent, I find it appalling that the Department of Health deems it appropriate to misinform the public regarding school health requirements. The department has yet to explain why they removed the religious exemption checkbox from the state school physical form. When did they remove it? And who authorized its removal? This demonstrates an egregious lack of transparency. Why should we trust a health agency that lies by omission? This is manipulative, and it subverts our informed consent. We have a right to be informed. Why does DOH need to misinform parents in an effort to raise adherence to the U.S. vaccine schedule? Shouldn't the National Vaccine Program stand on its own merits? Please pass this transparency bill and vote House Bill 5706 out of committee and onto the House floor. And I would like to address, um, there were some comments about the religious, um, about religion and what religions would have uh, some issues with uh, vaccination. And I would like to point out that in Rhode Island, a religion is a sincerely held belief. It does not have to be an organized religion. And um, I also wanted to address uh, Representative Fogarty's 
comment about HPV vaccine. Oh, okay, uh, many... Madalena, Madalena, I'm not yes. going to allow that right now. Um, we are in a, uh, a compressed time frame because of the amount of callers that we have. Um, and the HPV vaccine for her was just an example of vaccines. Um, I'm, I'm not going to take commentary regarding the HPV vaccine itself. Um, so I'm going to open up to questions from the committee for you, if you want to just hold on for one minute. Are there any questions from Adelina? Okay, we have uh, Representative Speakman first. Uh, hi there. Uh, hi. We've met several times, I think, on the House floor. Um, yes, we have. Yep. I, I, I do feel compelled to defend the Department of Health. Um, they have done extraordinary work for the past year. They're, they're out straight trying to protect us from this very difficult public health crisis. So I, I feel that your, your comments may be misplaced, although I understand what you're talking about. So my question for you is, if, if I went, um, if, I, if I don't um, vaccinate my children for whatever reasons, and I go to register them for school, and I'm unaware of this box checking thing, and I give the, and I have a physical form that does not have the religious exemption, but I, my children do not have a vaccination record, what would happen when I go to register them for school? Would someone ask me, why aren't your kids vaccinated? And then I would say, for religious reasons, and then what would happen? So generally what the schools do is they tell you that you need, a certain, you need certain vaccines in order to enter school. And most parents are under the impression that they're just simply required to do them. And so they're, unless you already know about a religious exemption, most parents comply regardless of whether or not they want to do it. I've had several families actually tell me, I didn't want to get the HPV vaccine, but I had to for school. Well, they were we never informed. Wouldn't they know that their religion discourages or prohibits vaccines? So again, they don't have to belong to an organized religion to have particular concerns. Uh, I would say that the, ma yeah. the majority of parents don't actually feel that it's a religious concern as much as a sincerely held belief that a particular, and it's usually not all of the vaccines across the board, it's usually that a particular one they may have some health concerns or safety concerns about it or maybe not feel it's necessary, but it's not particularly because of an organized religion. So, they're so they're, they don't realize. So they're claiming that there's a religious reason, but there really isn't a religious reason. Okay, thank you. It's a sincerely held belief. Thank you. I appreciate the clarification. Thank you. Sorry, Representative. Thank you, Representative Speakman. I appreciate the question. Uh, Representative Bia, you have a question. Go ahead. Our, do you have any word data to or indicate about the number of parents that have actually contacted you based on where schools or school district forcing their were them to, for of, of vaccination for vaccine? I'm sorry, I didn't quite understand what the question do was. Do I have data? Do you have any data indicating that where school district have been forced, like for if parents come or say like a I'm opting out for whatever reason not to work, uh, give my kid advice in. Do you have any data points indicating that or school dishes around Rhode Island have forced parents to take away against their own will, against their own, well, what, whatever reason they may claim? Do you have any data point indicating that? So I can give you a couple of examples. I don't have data, and I'm just a lay person in the community, but I do, because of what I do, I, I do interact with parents who reach out to me for help. I know that there was a Montessori school recently, I believe this was last year, who declined religious exemptions, even though that's actually unlawful, and the parents' only recourse was to sue. The Department of Health didn't back them up and, and, and get involved in any way. I know that when I submitted my school physical my doctor didn't know what to do about the fact that there was no religious exemption. I had to handwrite it in myself, and I obviously just already knew that it existed, but other parents don't know that. And so they're, they're very often misled into believing that they have no choice if they want to access education. I mean, uh, Chairman, can I have a follow-up? Yes, go, go ahead, Representative. All right, so we're, I mean, I've been doing this. I've been a principal, assistant principal now for like over like over 15 years in the state of Providence, right? And uh, out of my experiences, out of my uh, years in the city, and I've like met, uh, dealt with different, you know, religions and uh, were and like 
whatever reasons family have decided like uh because we know that parents have like uh that ultimate right to say like uh whatever it is i don't want my child or children to take the vice and it hasn't been any problem as far as i'm concerned so we're this this build this world like you know this will kind of keep going back to that like what is actually the intent of this because the ultimate goal like parents always have that final right to say like you know I don't want my child or my children to take this vaccine and uh, and do registration because I do register with a lot of kids, families from uh, all parts of Africa, like uh, Central America, everywhere, through uh, you know the Genesis Center, the International Institute. I do all of those work for the families that come and and they go within the school system and they register and like whatever documents they have and record that and that haven't been they haven't been any problems so. And this is where, like, uh, and this is where I'm falling between about this whole, uh, the, the intent of this bill. So Thank I would you. say that the intent of this bill is transparency. It's to accurately convey the existing law to parents, rather than than misleading them into thinking that they are required to do it with no recourse. Okay. Thank you for the question. Are there any others from the committee? Okay, Madalena, we're going to move on to the, uh, the next testimony. Thank you for testifying. Hello, this is Vice Chair Susan Donovan. You're speaking on Bill 5707. Could you please state your name before your testimony? Hello? I guess they're not there. Hello, 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 can you hear me? Yes, please state hello. your, hello, this is Vice Chair Susan Donovan. Um, can you please state your name before their testimony? Yes, good evening, thank you, Vice Chair. Uh, my name is Joe Daly. I'm an educator and a father from South Kingstown. I'm here to support H5706, and I'd like to thank the sponsors of this bill, including the committee chairman for their efforts to promote, to promote transparency with regard to Rhode Island state law. The school state physical form provided in my school district does not include the checkbox, checkbox for religious exemption. Unfortunately, obscuring state law from the public eye is a violation of informed consent. Why are not Rhode Island parents deserving of the law? I cannot think of any good reason why individuals should be denied informed consent. It never makes anything less safe. In fact, it, it, it protects people. And to manipulate families by withholding that information, it's an extremely poor way to try and implement public health. If, if the site is only set upon a metric by the Department of Health, it ignores the rights, and parent, uh, the rights of parents and individuals. And for so many of us, our health is not a data point. It's an individual decision based upon who we are as individuals, our unique bodies, the choices that we make in our lives, and most importantly, the decisions that we make with our doctors. That's where this decision-making about vaccination comes to. This bill simply lets parents express that right. As I said, my school state form does not include that checkbox. Despite the good work that they do, school nurses are often unaware of the law. Uh, in my district, we have to hand write the information in. You know, I, I don't quite understand why it's not standardized. Um, and for those parents who want to, uh, who want to take uh, advantage of the law, for whatever reason, uh, the, the reasons are not really not part of this discussion of this bill. It's just simply letting parents know that it is part of the law. The, the school uh, physical form, it is the mechanism for which parents are notified. There, there is no other, you know, uh, religious leaders are not required to inform, uh, it's not their role to inform uh, members of their religion about uh, school, you know, school state uh, physical forms. The, the school nurses don't do it. The family doctors don't do it. Uh, it's simply this form that parents get and have to fill out. Um, uh, here in tax season, I was reminded of good old Form 1040, which until uh, 2017, most of us remember had exemptions right there on the top of the front page. Maybe it was ourselves, our spouses, or our children. Those were our exemptions. It was part of the tax law. I mean, can you imagine if, if 
if that part of the law was not on the top of the Form 1040, we just had to instead write in what exemptions existed. Yeah. It's part of the law. You know, it sounds like a bad idea for the IRS. Maybe I hope I'm not leading them on here to something terrible. But uh, in any case, I think you get my point. This is, this is part of the law. We simply believe that parents okay. whose right it is to express that should have that, um, should have that available to them. Okay. Th thank you. Uh, thank you. Thank You're you. welcome. And, I, and I, I urge lawmakers to please talk to families who want to express their legal right because there are many of them uh, who, have, who have very interesting and specific reasons. And um, it, it, it kind of puts it in a personal level if you have an opportunity to speak to those families. So thank you for your uh, support of this bill. Thank you, Mr. Daly. Are there any questions for this witness? Okay, we'll move on to the next caller. Hello, this is Vice Chair Susan Donovan. We're hearing Bill 5707. Um, could you please state your name before your testimony, please? Um, is this 5706, I thought? Yes, 5706, I'm sorry. Hi, my name is Tara Lavasser. I'm here in support of Bill 5706 and keeping religious exemption and medical exemption in the schools. Okay, and you're... Um, okay. I'm sorry, say that again? No, you're... Go ahead, go, go on. Um, I am in support of keeping religious and medical exemptions in the schools. Um, my source, my light, and my faith have taught me to do no harm. I can no longer put my family or myself at risk with certain medical procedures that may compromise one of all of us due to our genetic makeup. Vaccination um, casualties and are not rare. Um, they do happen, and they are not often hidden. Um, I'm coming to you and allowing myself to be vulnerable in order to ask you to keep the religious and medical exemptions in school um, and to look inside of you and please look at your beliefs and your reasoning around it. I ask you to take time to look into your heart, your source, and your higher power, whatever that looks like for you. Um, why do we have an urgent need to take away this bill, knowing how many families it will negatively impact? and giving the parents the choice to take their kids out of the education in Rhode Island, out of the schools they grew up in over the several years, the schools that they love, and having the parents forced to homeschool their children. The parents don't want to do this. They want to send their kids to public schools to play with the kids that they love and to genuinely be in the schools they have been in in the past year. Why now take away this bill, especially in today's climate, when we have seen conflicting data and people are growing even more distrustful of the government concealing data such as COVID deaths in, from the elderly in nursing homes? Why not take the time to get the data before taking away rights with, that will clearly impact so many people who live or go to school in the state? Why would you consider hurting all those families who are showing up today to share their beliefs with you when you currently don't have data to prove that taking away this right causes any negative outcome. What, what we do know is that the use of religious exemptions in the last several years show that the percentage of people using religious exemptions are not causing any emergency, nor have they in the past 60 years during what during which time parents and families have exercised their rights to utilize religious exemption to their right to an education. Why create more distrust, distrust and frustration with government outreach without doing your due diligence? Example, in acting concerning a study on, on the religious exemption from school immunization requirements to require a study to provide data such as contact tracing on the number of students who claim a religious exemption from school immunization requirements who are the source of transmission of a vaccine preventable disease to an immunocompromised student or any unvaccinated person in a daycare school or camp in the state. That, to me, seems like a more logical path to look at data first and a scientific approach 
rather than make a hasty decision by removing an existing right of the people in this state without having something to back it up okay. other Ta than fear and fear itself. Tara, Tara. Thank you so much for your time. Thank you, Tara. Are there any questions for this witness? Okay. Thank you. We'll go on to the next caller. Hello, this is Vice Chair Susan Donovan of... <laughs> no. Hi, this is Vice Hello. Chair Susan Donovan. You're testifying on Bill 5707. Could you please state your name before your testimony? My name is Richard Abar. Okay. Thank you, Richard. You may go on. Hi, I just want to make this uh, quick. Uh, I believe all men and women have a choice regarding the medical decisions. And regardless of your stance, if you're you know, for vaccines or against vaccines, I believe uh, we all have the choice to make on our own bodily decisions whether you know, we want to have a vaccine or not. And uh, most people haven't looked at the ingredients, you know, the side effects. They've never looked at a vaccine insert package. Uh, they don't know that one of the side effects are death, um, um, brain, you know, seizures, um, anaphylactic shock, et cetera, you know. Um, I just want to say that everybody should have it, their own choice to make, and a philosophical exemption should be included in all forms, regardless if it's just kids, you know, high school students, uh, healthcare workers, you know, but that's all I want to say. Thanks. Thank, thank you, Richard. Are there any questions for this witness? Okay, we'll go on to the next caller. Hi, this is Vice Chair Donovan of Health and Human Services Committee. We're testifying on 5706. Could you please state your name before your testimony? Adriana Bonilla. Thank you, Adriana. Could you go on? You can continue. Okay. Good evening, representatives. Thank you for taking the time to hear my testimony. Today I speak for those that don't have the education, for those that don't know that they have this right, for those that feel it's an obligation where they feel stuck between a barrier. There is a choice, and these parents and children have the right to know in their school forms. Rather than continue to be in the dark on such an important topic, I speak on my own behalf. I myself was one of these people who were in the dark until some time ago. It was mentioned that they're easily accessible. First of all, if someone like the Health Choice had not brought this to my attention, I would have been these people who felt like it was an obligation. Had someone put this in the school form, that would have been easily accessible for me. So I speak on my own behalf. In conclusion, I ask that you representatives support this bill, which requires legal vaccination exemptions to be included on all school forms. As well, I also want to add that um, there was a comment made earlier about the medical exemption. Medical exemptions are not easily accessible as many would think. A medical exemption is actually very difficult to obtain. I'm well aware of this because there was a time that I was considering to get one myself. So many reasons why most claim to have a religious exemption is because they're unable to get a medical exemption. Thank you for your time. Thank you, Adriana. Are there any questions for this witness? Okay, we'll move on to the next caller. Hi, this is Vice. Could you turn off your device, please? Thank yeah. Thank you. This is Vice Chair Donovan of Health and Human Services. We're testifying on 5706. Could you please state your name before your testimony? Sure. My name is Amy Gardner, and I am calling in in full support of Bill 5706 and the transparency. Uh, of one of the major things that was repeated from messaging from the Rhode Island State House throughout the last year of the COVID epidemic is transparency, and yet they are not giving transparency through the schools and the other forms of correspondence in regards 
to what the rights are for the vaccination options in the state of Rhode Island. And it is used with wording of required, mandatory, et cetera, usually in capital letters, very much giving the impression that even if this is against somebody's belief system, that they don't know that they can actually utilize that right against their belief system. Because a religious belief is based on your personally held belief system. It is not based on a congregation or an entire statement from an organized religion. And just to give a quick example, is abortion is our topic, the hot topic, but some people from the same religion are okay and some people are not. And there is aborted fetal cells used in vaccines. That will make some people feel that that is a religious reason not to choose this, whereas other people will not feel it is a religious reason, and they might both go to the same church. This is about your personally held religious belief, not organized religion, and everybody deserves to know that they have that right that they can enact and use, and it is not transparent, and it is not ethical, and it is a form of coercion to use words like mandatory, required, and stating that children cannot enter school without these vaccinations, and yet not identifying the other pieces of the law. Our public school departments and our Rhode Island Department of Health should not be using coercion. We should support this bill. Everybody should support this bill in the fact that it is transparent, it is our current law, and it is simply saying that the public has a right to know the current law. We are changing nothing. We are not encouraging anything one way or the other. We are saying here is what Rhode Island law says, and here is how you have a right to enact your personal beliefs should you have them. And it's very simple, it's very basic, and I implore all of the committee to support transparent documentation and transparent communication with all of the citizens of the state of Rhode Island. Thank you, Amy. Are there any questions for this witness? Okay, we'll go on to the next caller. Hello, this is Vice Chair Susan Donovan of Health and Human Services. You're testifying on Bill 5706. Could you please state your name before your testimony? Yes, um, my name is Deborah Jennings. I live in Middletown. I'm a registered nurse. I um, want to thank everybody in the committee and greetings to the chair and the vice chair and the second vice chair and the sponsors of this bill. Um, as Rep. Phillips said pretty distinctly, this is just about transparency. It's unfortunate that we had to get into this whole uh, discussion about vaccines. And the only thing I want to say about that is both held but beliefs by some in that committee that spoke out, they have to realize there's two sides of this equation. And as that woman, Adriana, pointed out, she didn't know this. Nobody told her. She had to learn the hard way. And I think she's representation of a lot of citizens in Rhode Island. And all we need to have a consistency. There, there needs to be a flawless interface between the Department of Health and their messaging with, with the pediatricians even. They need to know with the school, with the school nurses. Everybody's got to get on the same page, and this has to be communicated to the community, to the students, the parents of the students, that there is a choice in Rhode Island and they have religious exemptions in place if they choose to exercise those because the medical exemptions are very, very difficult to secure. And um, that's really about it. This is just about transparency, and it, it's just going to bring a greater trust in the public health system and in the whole medical community. And I don't think that those people that choose to exercise this right are threatening in any way, shape, or form anyone else. 
Thank you, Deborah. Um, are there any questions for this witness? Okay, thank you. Um, go on to the next caller. No calls? That's okay. That, so that finishes the verbal testimony. We have written testimony in favor of this bill from Madalena uh, Cridinata, Deborah O'Leary, Michelle Maynard, Aaron Dussault, Christine Waldeck, Kelly Morgan, and Patricia Millen. And we have written testimony against this um, from Ben Chadnock and Nicole Alexander Scott from the Rhode Island Department of Health. That closes the hearing on 5706. We're going to move on to 5716 from Representative Caldwell. Welcome, Representative Caldwell. <laughs> Thank you, Chairwoman. Thank you to members of the committee. Um, I'm here to introduce House Bill 5715, I had written down, but that could be a typo, um, which would prohibit the sale of tobacco products in pharmacies. Uh, it would include pharmacies like we think of, like such as a place as like Walgreens and uh, in bigger box stores that have pharmacies like a Walmart. So I'm introducing this bill um, with and on behalf of the American Lung Association and someone from that group, I believe Dan Fitzgerald, will hopefully um, be on to talk about the bill and answer questions um, better than I can. But I do want to make a couple of quick points. Uh, first, one factor we always look at here in the House is what our neighboring states do on this issue. And so two states in the U.S. have laws banning tobacco products in pharmacies, and those two states happen to be New York and Massachusetts. Um, they enacted those laws relatively recently, so we could um, add to that list and join our neighbors in New England leading the way on this issue. Uh, cigarettes being for sale at pharmacies make it harder for folks who are trying to quit smoking to do so successfully. Um, and it also allows people who are there at the pharmacy to pick up their drugs for conditions uh, made uh, more harmful by smoking to get their medications and buy you know, tobacco products at the same time. So simply put, when I was approached but for this bill, you know, I look at it and I think that pharmacies are really about being a place where we get medicine and advice to keep us safe and uh, help us get healthy. They shouldn't be places where we can buy products that we know without beyond a shadow of a doubt are incredibly harmful to our health like cigarettes. Uh, so thank you for considering the bill. Uh, like I said, I do believe there be a few experts testifying, though I'm happy to take any questions and if I can answer them or if not, uh, follow back up with you with any answers. Thank, Thank you, you, Representative Caldwell. Any questions for the representative? Okay, I guess we'll Thank take you. Um, the first caller. And it should be Daniel Fitzgerald from the American Lung Association. Daniel, are you there? Hi, yes. Yes, this is Representative Donovan from the Health and Human Services Committee, and you're testifying on Bill 5716. Wonderful. Well, thank you so much, Vice Chair Donovan, and thank you to all the members of the House Health and Human Services Committee. Uh, my name is Daniel Fitzgerald, and I work for the American Lung Association as our National Senior Manager of Advocacy, and I serve as our advocacy lead here in the state of Rhode Island. Across the nation, two million smokers last purchased their cigarettes from a pharmacy. As trusted healthcare facilities, pharmacies are a place for customers to purchase products and medications to get well. Selling tobacco, a deadly product that kills more than 480,000 Americans a year, 800, uh, 1,800 of which are Rhode Islanders, seems to be contrary to that mission. Some of the strongest evidence in support of tobacco-free pharmacy laws actually comes from a study from the American Journal of Preventative Medicine, which found that after CVS Health, the Rhode Island-based company, stopped selling tobacco in September 2014, cigarette pack sales decreased and nicotine patch uh, purchases increased in states where the chain had large retail presence. 
Additionally, adolescents and young adults are uniquely vulnerable to the effects of nicotine and nicotine dependence, causing lasting adverse consequences on brain development. And here in Rhode Island, we know that about a third of youth use at least one tobacco product. And unfortunately, FDA compliance data shows us that some large pharmacy chains that still sell tobacco products are the leading sellers of tobacco products to underage individuals. Um, and as was mentioned, tobacco-free pharma- pharmacy laws have actually been spreading across the country since 2008. In fact, there's 243 municipalities spread across four states that have prohibited the sale of tobacco products in pharmacies. Um, and in 2018, our neighbors to the north, Massachusetts, became the first state to pass a tobacco-free pharmacy law um, at the state level. And in April 2020, New York followed suit. Current bills um, have traction in both Connecticut and New Jersey um, right now as well. So with that said, the American Lung Association believes that this legislation has the potential to significantly reduce tobacco use and save thousands of lives, and therefore, I would urge you to uh, swiftly pass um, these measures to help protect Rhode Islanders from a lifetime of dependence and nicotine. And if you are interested in any additional information, I would point you to the written testimony that we provided with support from over 15 public health medical organizations, as well as some really incredible written testimony provided from pharmacists. And lastly, I would just like to say thank you, Representative Caldwell, for introducing this bill. Thank you to all of the sponsors who signed on, and thank you specifically to each of you as the members of this committee for your dedication to this issue. Thank you for the opportunity. Thank you, Daniel. Are there any questions for this witness? Uh, Representative Fogarty. Uh, Daniel, just a quick question. Since CVS Health, um, you know, put this in play back in 2004, they said that they've had... um, more people like going for the uh, smoking deterrent um, products. Um, And I'm just wondering if it's affected their bottom line in a positive way and if you could use that with some of the other pharmacy chains to um, help reduce um, these products being in some of the other pharmacies. I'm just wondering. Yeah, for sure. Thank you. Yeah, go ahead. I'm sorry. If they're following what CVS is doing. Thank you for your question. And um, I do know, you know, there's been, you know, a lot of that communicated to other pharmacy chains from a variety of organizations. Um, You know, and and unfortunately, there has been no movement since 2014 for any other national change to follow suit after CVS Health. Um, I I do know that there is some publicly available data that I'd be happy to make available to the committee. I don't have the numbers offhand, but to better speak to kind of what that, that impact looked like. Um, for CBS, if that would be helpful. Just, just from, yeah, I'm just interested. Thank you. Sure. Uh, thank you. Um, is there any more, any other questions? All right. Thank you, Daniel. Um, thank you. That concludes the verbal testimony. Uh, we have written testimony submitted in favor of this legislation from Anita Jackson, Rhode Island Kids Count, American Lung Association. American Cancer Society, American Heart Association, Brown University School of Public Health, Campaign for Tobacco-Free Kids, Oasis International, Providence, Rhode Island, Open Door Health, Preventing Tobacco Addiction Foundation, Progress Latino, Rhode Island Academy of Family Physicians, Rhode Island Medical Society, Rhode Island Public Health Institute, Rhode Island Radiologist Society, Rhode Island Student Assistance Services, and Rhode Island Thoracic Society. And that concludes testimony on 5716. Next bill is 5845 by our own Representative Bennett. Thank you. Uh, This bill was given to me by the previous governor, Governor Raimondo. Uh, It's an act that requires patient contact employees, personal care attendants, high-risk providers to undergo undergo a national criminal records check and would disqualify those from such employment if they have a criminal records, a criminal record of crimes of violence or other offenses listed. The offenses are listed on page five. Uh, What this would do, it would... um, The Department of the Attorney General may establish and maintain an automated fingerprint identification system database. They'd also be able to uh, maintain electronic and web-based system. 
And if you are have a, a criminal background and a list of things that, that you're disqualified for, but if you get a charge on you while you're already in the position that the Attorney General will, will generate that information to the Executive Office of um, Health and Human Services, and you will receive a letter of disqualification and uh, relief, relief of your job. Um, and if you look, they're pretty harsh. Uh, murder, stuff like that. Um, patient abuse, mistreatment of patients, burglary, first degree arson. But it, I'm not going to read that because you can read it for yourself. Um, all it's doing is tightening up the current system for checking people's backgrounds. Um, and keeping up with it. You know, if somebody does something now, you know, and they're in the process of being prosecuted, they're fine the innocent, nothing would happen to them. But if they're found guilty, we have to have a system in place that can track that and get it to the right authorities so the person is not in the position of harming others. Thank you, Representative Bennett. Are there any questions for the representative? Yes, Representative Potter. Thank you, Madam Chair. Uh, Chairman Bennett, just a, a small suggestion. I think it's a great bill, and I'd be happy to support it. I would respectfully ask um, that we remove felony drug offenses from the list of, of felonies uh, in, in disqualifying crimes that people could be convicted of. I think we have to be mindful of how the war on drugs has disproportionately affected communities of color. And so many people are in a position where they're, they're you know, theoretically could be working, trying to get their life back on, on track. And, um, you know, the prosecu prosecutorial discretion that uh, people have when they're deciding to charge somebody with a felony offense or with a misdemeanor uh, disproportionately has affected people of color. And uh, I think that's, that's a very small uh, edit that we could make that would be really, really impactful and, and make this legislation without a flaw. So I would just ask that that's something that maybe we consider. Thank you. Um, the other night in judiciary, we had uh, the attorney general on and we discussed lowering certain crimes to misdemeanors. And he said that a felony drug conviction usually means you're a dealer or, or a, a smuggler or something of that nature, it's a serious crime. He's trying to break down simple possession to misdemeanor. So I think that if you are a drug dealer or you're trafficking in drugs to the point where it's a felony count, then you should not be taking care of people, especially people that are, are mentally ill or, or aged, um, you know, because you could possibly, there's a lot of possibilities that I don't want to start getting into the possibilities of what these people may do. But uh, when you're taking care of somebody and you're putting them, you know, they're, they're putting their trust in you, you know, you have to be, be um, able to be trusted, I, I guess is a good word. As me, myself as a nurse, I can't have a criminal record, I can't have a criminal background, I can't ever have anything against my record. And, and if I do, they disqualify you. And I think that this bill has been tightened up really well. I understand about the, the felony drug conviction, but the Attorney General has addressed this where, where possession of a certain amount for your own use, um, even right into opioids, is, is um, a misdemeanor. You know, and he's got that in front of Jude, Jude now. But um, a felony, drug conviction or a felony arrest and you're proven guilty, I think should still disqualify you from taking care of um, vulnerable people. But I will suggest it. Like I said, this bill came from the governor. She's not, I imagine Governor McKee would back it, but it's Attorney General, the, the EOHSS have all talked about this, so EOH, I always get that messed up. Um, you know, and, and it's something that we're trying to keep vulnerable people safe, you know, and, and if we don't watch out for them, then, you know, there's, there's people out there, it's like the 
the molester that goes out and gets a job with an ice cream man, you know? We gotta watch stuff like that, and it's, this tightens it up. I think it's a good bill, and I hope people will support it. And I can mention it to uh, the Attorney General or, or the new governor to see if they would like to strike a felony drug offense, but I don't see it happening. Thank you, Representatives. Representative Geraldo? <laughs> mm -hmm. Yeah, there, there you go. go. There you go. <laughs> thank you. Um, thank you, Chairman Benny. Chairman, can, can you tell me how this bill would speak to someone who received a, um, a robbery charge maybe 20 years ago? Would this still disqualify them from, from the position? That's a good question. I don't know that answer. Is there a time? Um, is there a, or more specifically, is there like a, a time limit where these would continue? Statute of limitations. Yeah. I don't know the statute of limitations. I'm not a lawyer. Maybe is there any lawyers here? No. You a lawyer? I, I think we're going to get testimony from the attorney general's office. Yeah, there you so that go. might be a question for them. Thank you. Okay. Yes. Thanks. Appreciate it. Thank you. Good question. Okay. Um, if there are no more questions, we'll go on to the first caller. It's Hannah Stern from the ACLU, Rhode Island. Hannah, are you there? I am. Hi, Hannah. This is Representative Donovan. You're testifying on Bill 5845. Great. Thank you. Uh, thank you, Madam Chair and members of the committee, for your time again this evening. My name is Hannah Stern. I'm testifying on behalf of the ACLU of Rhode Island. Uh, I know it's been a long night, and we've submitted written testimony, so I'll be brief, but I just wanted to note that, from our perspective, the provisions that would be implemented by this bill are actually even more stringent than the current guidance in place through EOHHS as it relates to criminal record checks for personal care attendants. Um, as you heard me testify earlier, the ACLU is generally very concerned that broad criminal record checks can perpetuate cycles of discrimination against justice-involved individuals, but we would like to express a more specific concern about how this could impact um, um, personal care attendants who may be the child or directly related to the person they're providing care for. Um, as we know, Medicaid does permit family members to become caregivers, and EOHHS guidance um, allows for a patient to personally decide whether certain convictions are disqualifying when they're choosing their PCA. So this bill does not allow that discretion. It would actually expand the types of offenses which would be subject to automatic disqualification. In just one example from our reading, a child who is, or a, a child who is caring for an elderly or disabled parent who may qualify um, as a PCA under EOHHS guidance could be disqualified under this bill on the basis of, for example, a 20-year-old drug, a felony drug offense, which we think is a very concerning potential issue to arise from this language. Uh, like I said, under current EOHHS guidelines, it appears that this type of offense could waived by the patient, which we think is entirely appropriate and considerate of the circumstances which may need to be navigated, especially for familial caregivers. So we are opposed on those grounds. Uh, thank you very much for your time, and I'd be happy to take any questions. Thank you, Hannah. Are there any questions for Hannah? Okay, we'll go on to the next caller. Um, it's Ryan Holt from the Attorney General's Office. Hello, Mr. Holt. This is Vice Chair Susan Donovan from Health and Human Services. You're testifying on Bill 5845. Thank you, Madam Chair, and good evening. Uh, good, e good evening, everybody. Uh, this is uh, Ryan Holt, the Director of Legislative Affairs for Attorney General Morona. Um, not taking a pro or con position on the bill, but I just wanted to um, just note that we would hope that uh, when uh, assessing this bill that, the, that we'd be able to just assess the impact on operations uh, it would have if passed. Uh, and just for the committee's uh, awareness, just wanted to note some of the work that our, our BCI unit uh, currently does. Um, about 120 background, national background checks a day are processed uh, at BCI uh, in normal times. Uh, 300 state background checks a day uh, processed at, at BCI, uh, as well as uh, the basically the front line for uh, security uh, licenses, uh, concealed carry permit licenses, uh, concealed carry permits, um, also the, the uh, kind of intake place for the consumer protection unit, and uh, if folks are filing expungements, um, which you know is 
is, is great. You know, we have a, a staff that works very hard to process folks uh, as quickly as possible, uh, making sure that that line, again, in times when, when folks can gather inside, that line is not too long of a wait for anybody that visits us. Um, but the, uh, the background checks that are processed every year uh, has been steadily rising uh, over the past few years, about 10 or so percent each year, but our staffing level has remained the same. Uh, so I just wanted to, to be able to have the ability to assess the impact uh, that it would have on, on the operations. But one other thing to note, any time uh, the General Assembly needs to pass a, uh, a statute uh, allowing for a national background check, we do need to vet that statutory language through the FBI. Uh, and, you know, should the committee uh, want to move this bill or an amended version of this bill, uh, happy to work with, with you all to uh, make sure the FBI has a chance to review uh, that language as well. Um, so with that, uh, that that's, that's all I have to say, but if you have any questions, I'm happy to answer them if I can. Thank you, Mr. Holt. Are there any questions? For the, uh, yes, Representative Kassar. Um, thank you, Ryan, uh, for this. Just, I'm trying to understand if what you were saying in regards to the um, workload, the increased workload, yep. um, are you indicating that we would need additional staff in order to accommodate this, um, these it, requests? It depends, it depends Representative. Um, we'd have to, you know, determine uh, how many folks um, this, you know, this and would end up applying to, as well as just assessing that with, with I know that the General Assembly is currently considering uh, several other um, statutes to authorize more national background checks. Um, so we'd have to just kind of take a holistic view of that. Okay, thank you. And is in regards to what the FBI would need to review, um, mm -hmm. it, is there sort of standard language that should be already be included here, or do we know um, kind of what the parameters are of that? It, it kind of it kind of depends um, on you know the different statute, but there is a unit within the FBI that generally reviews it and uh, will kind of give it a, a thumbs up or a thumbs down. Uh, so we'd have to just run that run that through them. But but you know I guess a good rule of thumb is to look at other other statutes that have passed, and it, a lot of it comes down to the um, you know how the results are conveyed to the uh, the requester um, but you know it, it, it's a case by case basis right um, and then just a final question kind of picking up on what my colleague um, representative Potter uh, asked earlier in the hearing um, due to the um, inequitable nature of our criminal justice system um, having a disproportionate impact on um, communities of color and low-income communities, some of these offenses that are outlined here may just perpetuate um, that. And then in specific, the topic that came up was the fel felony drug offenses. Um, sure. Does the AG's office have an opinion on the statute of limitations, um, as was mentioned by Rep. Geraldo, um, is there anything that would be recommended here or any standard to consider? Um, you know that's a that's a great question, Rep. I think that's really more of a, a, a policy question for the for the committee. I was really here to to talk about the actual logistics of this, but I would know, um, you know, that we do uh, have <laughs> have a bill in another committee that uh, would reclassify drug possession, and we do have um, we have been on record in support of a uh, small, a lower range of time for um, expungement eligibility for simple possession of, of controlled substances. I know that's kind of a little off topic, but just wanted to note that's where we, where we stand. Okay, no, that's fine. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you, Mr. Holt. Are there any more questions for this witness? Okay, we'll go on to the next caller. Hi, Bob Marshall. This is Susan Donovan, Vice Chair of Health and Human Services. You're testifying on Bill 5845. Thank you, thank you uh, Vice Chair, for the opportunity to testify on behalf of the Rhode Island Development of Disabilities Council on this bill, and thank you to 
uh, Representative Barrett for putting this in and bringing this topic up again. This is a topic that we have testified on over and over again over the years. We strongly, strongly agree that criminal background checks are needed, but we have not been able to get a bill that deals with the fact that for the people that are self-directing or using PCAs, we're in, in using Buddha funds, um, they end up being the employer of that PCA. So, and they also very often hire multiple people for very few hours. These are not full-time jobs. These are, might hire somebody for two hours to, every Sunday to take you to church. You might hire somebody to come in for an hour every morning to help you get out of bed. Um, but you don't want the same person all seven days because you need multiple people in case one of them gets sick. You're not going to stay in bed all day. So you tend to, and they tend to be people that you're hiring for two, three, five hours a week. And then you hit them, so you try to recruit them to do this for you, and that's a big enough challenge to begin with. And then you hit them with, well, before you can take, before we can give you this job for two hours a week that pays ten, eleven dollars an hour. Um, we need to get you up to Cranston to go to the Attorney General and hand over thirty-five dollars or so uh, for a criminal record check, and that's where this always ends up breaking down. And then this particular version of the bill also throws a hundred-dollar fee on the employer for registering. Well, that employer is the person very much in need of services and usually with no money. So that's where we keep having trouble with this, and no one seems to want to come up with a way to pay for it. Um, the having the PCAs pay is it makes the recruiting process, which is already very difficult, more difficult, and having the employer pay is even more ridiculous because, like I said, you're talking about someone that is usually fairly severely disabled and has is living on SSI, and for them to and, and, for, and, you know, for them to pay for four, five, or six of these things as a normal employer would do um, just isn't workable. So we, this really needs to be done, but we have to either put some money in the Attorney General's office so they cover the fee to the federal government, put some money in Buddha so that it becomes a reimbursable expense for people that are self-directing, but just putting the law in place and not dealing with how it's going to get paid for, it really makes it unworkable. I'd be happy to take any questions. Thank you. Are there any questions for Mr. Marshall? Okay, thank you, Mr. Marshall. That concludes the testimony on 5845. And the next bill we're going to hear, are we going to do Yeah, it? we are going to move on to House Bill 5551. This is a bill by Representative Lima regarding cruelty to animals. I will give you a brief synopsis. This bill would ban a person or manufacturer from selling or offering for sale in the state any cosmetic that was developed or manufactured using animal testing. If the test was conducted or contracted by the manufacturer or any supplier of the manufacturer on or after January 1st, 2022, a violation of this act could result, would result in a $1,000 fine for each offense. Representative Lima's bill uh, has three people for uh, testimony, and we're going to go to our first verbal testimony. Hello, Vicki. This is Representative Casey from the House Health and Human Services Committee. How are you doing today? I'm fine, thank you. Good. Thanks for hanging in with us. Um, I know you have... Uh, supplied some written testimony and you are interested in uh in supporting uh with an amendment i believe yes okay if you could just keep the testimony brief right now i would appreciate that um you can go right ahead you have the ears of the committee thank you so much and thanks for hearing this bill today uh, the humane study of the united states is uh presenting this testimony on behalf of our rhode island members and supporters and we're urging the committee to pass H5551, which prohibits the sale in Rhode Island of any cosmetic for which a new animal test was conducted or contracted by or on behalf of the manufacturer or any supplier of the manufacturer. 
uh, it does contain some very limited exceptions that um, are agreed to by industry. Uh, the cosmetics manufacturers have supported legislation on the federal level that mirrors the provisions in H5551, and it also has the support of several companies that are selling cosmetic products in the state of Rhode Island, including Lush, Pure Eco Spa and Boutique, and Solita. Um, animal testing is not only cruel, but it's also been shown to be an unreliable predictor of human responses, and therefore um, there are better ways to test cosmetic products. Fortunately, it's completely unnecessary because there are no animal testing requirements for cosmetic safety substantiation in the U.S., and companies can already create great products using thousands of available ingredients that already have a history of safe use and do not require new testing. For new ingredients, where animal testing may currently be used, there are non-animal methods available that provide more reliable results. And this is just part of a global trend to eliminate cosmetic animal testing. Uh, just this last week, Virginia became the fourth state in the country to prohibit the sale of animal-tested cosmetics, and so we're now asking Rhode Island to do the same. Thank you so much. Thank you for your testimony, Vicki. Are there any questions from the committee at this time? Okay, we are going to go ahead with our next testimony. Thank you, Vicki. Hello, this is Representative Casey. This is Chairman Bob Goldberg. How are you? Mr. Goldberg, I'm doing just fine. Thanks for hanging with us tonight. Um, you're here on House Bill 5551 by Representative Lima. If you would go ahead with your testimony. Thank you very much, uh, Chairman and members of the committee. To be very brief, I'm testifying on behalf of the Humane Society of the United States as well. I don't want to repeat the prior witness's testimony. I'd just like to um, alert you, Mr. Chairman, that uh, the Humane Society has some amendments to this bill, which I will get to you. Primarily, um, the biggest change in the amendment is it holds the manufacturer responsible, not the local merchant should he err in doing this, but it gives more to the manufacturer. And I obviously completely support the prior testimony. Given the late hours, um, I can be contacted at any time, and I will uh, provide the amendments to you, Mr. Chairman. Thank you, sir. If you would, uh, you could forward them to, uh, to the committee uh, through the clerk and myself. Very good. Thank you. Thank you. Are there any questions for Mr. Goldberg? Okay, we're going to move on. Hello, Mr. Lopes. Yes, good evening, Chairman. <coughs> Excuse me, how are you tonight? I'm doing well. How about yourself? Good. We're here on 5551. If you would go ahead with your testimony. Absolutely. Thank you, Mr. Chairman and members of the committee. Leonard Lopes on behalf of Personal Care Products Council. We are the beauty industry uh, trade association. And I uh, just want to say that uh, PCPC supports the concepts contained in the legislation. However, we also look forward to working with the sponsor on a few clarification uh, amendments. Uh, the cosmetic industry has long worked towards eliminating the use of animal testing and has been strong leaders in the, in the search for and development of alternative cosmetic testing methods for safety assessments. Uh, we've worked uh, around the country and around the globe, Mr. Chairman, to gain acceptance of these methods. This issue is advancing in several other states, have we, and we just heard that, and we are committed to consistency in working on this issue further. I likewise uh, will get amendments to the sponsor and to yourself and look forward to working with Representative Lima on this matter. And thank you very much. Thank you, Mr. Lopes. Are there any questions for Mr. Lopes at this time? Okay, hearing none. Thank you, Mr. Lopes. We're going to move on. Thank you. Okay, just for the record, I would like to reflect that uh, for written testimony, um, we have Rose Maloney from Pure Eco Spa Boutique is in support. Trisha Stevens from Lush Handmade Cosmetics is in support. 
Lexis Fernandez from Solita is in support. Barbara Hodges from the Humane Society is in support. Christine Scarigne from the Animal Defenders International is in support. Cruelty Free International is in support. Krista Albrecht from Vegas is in support. The Rhode Island Business Coalition is against this bill. Uh, the coalition includes the Rhode Island Certi Society of Certified Public Accountants, Rhode Island Manufacturers Association, Rhode Island Association of Realtors, Rhode Island Hospitality Association, North Kingstown Chamber of Commerce, Rhode Island Small Business Economic Summit, and the Associated Builders and Contractors of Rhode Island. Then we have in support a Jordan Gord Goyette, Leah Hubbard, and Christopher R. Arnold, who is works for the Secretary of Defense. Are there any comments or questions from the committee before I close the hearing? Okay, we'll close House Bill 5551. Vice Chair Donovan, if you would take the next bill, 5708, which is from Representative Potter. Representative Potter, you have the choice of testifying from your chair or from the podium. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. I think I'll stay put. Go right ahead. All right. Uh, thank you, fellow members of the committee. So this bill uh, actually came to me from a constituent. Uh, she had reached out to me really concerned with the increase in frequency of power outages. And uh, she is somebody who uses a CPAP machine at night to, to breathe. Um, as we were talking, she mentioned to me that her health insurance carrier had denied her coverage uh, on purchasing a backup battery for her machine. And if I recall correctly from speaking to her, I believe she told me that the insurance provider told her that it was a quote unquote luxury. So I looked into the cost of these batteries and they can be anywhere from 200 to $400. And, um, you know, just considering that, when I think of most people who are using a CPAP machine, um, they're probably, I'm gonna go on a limb, elderly people, uh, probably on a, on a fixed income, and, you know, a few hundred dollars can really be uh, the difference maker in whether or not somebody uh, purchase, purchases that or has the ability to purchase that. So uh, you would think that, you know, if somebody might not opt to get it, uh, understanding that the folks that hook up to these machines aren't just doing it as, a, as a, an option, right? It's really uh, providing a health benefit to them. We would think that uh, health insurers would want to provide that kind of coverage and keep and keep their uh, insured in, in the best uh, health possible. And it seems like such a no brainer um, that that, you know, we would we would act on this um, and provide those people a safety net in the event of a of a medical emergency it will be a medical emergency in the event of a power outage. So I think it's pretty straightforward, um, not a controversial bill uh, open to any questions, but I would uh, very much hope to have the committee support on it. Thank you. Are there any questions from the committee for Representative Potter? Thank you, Representative Potter. Gonna close? Okay, I guess that closes the committee hearing. Close oh, close the hearing on <laughs> paid, uh, Bill 5708. And you can okay, are there, before we close the hearing entirely, are there any questions or commentary from the committee? Okay. Uh, once again, I'd like to thank all of you committee members here and with us uh, virtually for uh, your attendance and your attention tonight. Uh, again, it's been a long meeting. Everybody, please drive home safe. This will close the meeting. I will take one motion for adjournment. So moved. Okay, from Representative Geraldo. Any seconds? Is anyone in favor? <laughs> the, meeting, the meeting is adjourned. <laughs>